I grew up in a white neighborhood, and I mean really white, like 0.6% black. Growing up around all white people messes my mind up. I have a sense of self-hate that's hard to overcome. There's massive pressure to be what the white world expects of me, fit in with people who don't look like me, fit their standards of perfection, quiet, proper, well-dressed. While receiving so many negative messages about people who do look like me, I literally grow up thinking that I was better than other black people because of the way that I spoke, behaved, dressed, the way my hair looked. I buck back against the system. I'm the skater kid, the Wiccan kid, the one getting kicked out of Mr. Lesh's classroom copying dictionary pages as punishment outside. Watching 90210, I learn about cutting. The girl who cuts on the show gets the help she needs once Donna finds out she's harming herself. Rich white folks in Beverly Hills get therapy, but in my world, we don't talk about mental health. I start cutting. It's not that easy for me. At 18, I'm away at college. Loneliness, high expectations of success, and unchecked mental health issues lead me to a suicide attempt and a stay in one of Boston's fine hospitals. After getting out of the hospital, I meet this dark, tall, handsome Jamaican man, Brian. We soon start dating. One night, his friend Jan stops by and asks, you want a party? And takes out some drugs. It's not anything I've seen before. What is that? I ask. As she starts to prepare it, she tells me, it's like Coke. All right, I've done Coke. That's no big deal. Let's party. Jan teaches us how to make a pipe out of a Smirnoff bottle, a pen, and takes the diamonds out of her ears to poke holes in the foil. She sets us up. Here, try this. It's not until after I've already started smoking this stuff that I find out what it is. Crack. Immediately, I love it. For the first time in a long time, I feel like everything could be okay. Like I have the ability and the skills to be anything I want to be. We talk about our dreams and the future and what life could be like for all of us. But after the high wears off, meeting those expectations is a lot harder than dreaming them. So we want more and more and more. All of our money and free time goes to crack. Our lives go to crack. I lose my apartment and move in with Brian. Every time we try to stop, our rich friend Jan comes by with her drugs and her diamond earrings and we start all over again. She has access to all the fancy rehabs. Rich white folks in Boston are like the ones in Beverly Hills. They get rehab, they get help. It isn't that easy for us. I'm doing lines at work to get through the day. It gets real bad when I don't show up for finals. All my teachers try to get me there, but I can't get myself there. When Jan isn't around, Brian and I are scrounging and selling things to get our next high. Late at night, checking the floors for rocks. Most of the time, we end up smoking kitty litter. It's time to get clean. I try staying with friends. So many of them take me in in the middle of the night and put me up. I take advantage of every single situation. Even the kind guy who offers me the world to be with him instead of my drug addicted boyfriend but I always chose the drugs. Rehab is a failure for me, and I start thinking that maybe it's time to go home, to a place where I can get sober, where I can reconnect with people that I know. Leaving college isn't an option, though. We go to college, that's what we do. One day, I'm crossing the street. A disheveled woman with dirt on her face, wearing a ratty coat and layers of clothes is walking towards me. She grabs me in the crosswalk and says, don't be like Whitney. Whitney never gave up the drugs. She means Whitney Houston. Even she knows I'm addicted to crack and I could be more if I give up the drugs. Time to go home. I don't think my mom was ever accepting of me leaving Northeastern. She still brings up the student loans that she paid for my one year in college, a symbol that I had failed the expectations she put in front of me. The path to getting clean is a long one. Drugs are everywhere. Back home, friends are smoking crack. I spend my time hanging at the local park, drinking and doing drugs. Again and again, I try to get sober. 
I'm standing at the bus stop. The bus is over 45 minutes late. It's snowing, and I'm late for work. A man pulls up and offers me a ride. I joke about not getting murdered. He laughs, and I get in. The next thing he says to me is unbelievable. Just so you know, I sell crack. He tells me to take his number in case I need a ride or anything else and drops me off at my job. He must have been out recruiting potential addicts because he didn't like taking money from pretty girls. There were other ways we could get our drugs. It gets bad again, really bad. I move out to live with a man who gives me unlimited drugs in exchange for me, I guess. I don't live there long, eventually finding a new place with new friends who also do drugs. Why does everyone smoke crack? Crack is whack, y'all. What the hell? <laughs> it's Andrew who eventually helps me get clean. And he's such a douche, and I don't, outside of the fact that he gave me my oldest daughter, I don't want to give him credit for nothing. But it was time, and he was there. He doesn't throw me away every time I make a mistake, disappearing for days at a time to get high. He takes me to NA meetings and eventually knocks me up, which becomes my biggest reason for staying clean. When I get pregnant with Liliana, I'm five months sober. I'm given two options, get married or get an abortion. So I choose the path of creating the life that's expected for me, the life that is leading towards a white picket fence, the life that gets me the nice husband and the ring. I know I want to leave him before I marry him. It takes a year. Leaving him is reminiscent of leaving college. This isn't what we do, but I did. I never thought about the impact on my life as a black person in a white space until I really started understanding racism. Those struggles, piece by piece, bit by bit, brought me to a different perception of my expectations and a newfound refusal to submit to the ideas that are set forth. When I gave up trying to live up to the expectations that white people have put on me and what a familial structure looks like, wait. I think I'm pushing myself to have this neatly closed ending, like this is the moment when I stopped allowing societal pressures to impact my behavior, or this is the moment when I stopped using unhealthy coping mechanisms to handle my emotions. But I don't think that moment has fully happened yet, you know? But I do know that we do have to talk about this. We've got to talk about this. I'm talking about this right now. <laughs>